Last week, I was in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, way up north, and it still snowed on me up there, believe it or not. And I was rebuking the snow, then I fly into Denver, Colorado in the midst of a snowstorm. But how many know that it doesn't matter what the devil does, God's better, God's greater. While I was up there, you know, there's, I, I have met literally thousands of ministers over the years. But there's very, very few that you can say that are kindred spirits. You know, there, there, are, there are people that you meet that drain from you. There are people that you meet that don't do anything for you. Sometimes they just rub you the wrong way. <laughs> but every once in a while, you meet one that's a kindred spirit that you begin feeding each other. It's iron sharpening iron, and that's the way I was with the apostle uh, Kevin Tabucci up in Canada. And I'll probably be making a trip up there probably once a quarter. Pray for me. They keep on making those planes smaller, and I keep getting bigger for some reason, but we need to reverse that trend. But I, I felt like God was doing some things in me and doing some things up there, and I actually believe that God is beginning to uh, establish a biblical council. Remember back in 1997, for you guys that was here when we had, we had a conference, God had me speak about biblical councils. I'm just now beginning to see the formation of the first one. And uh, no telling who's going to end up as a part of it. Uh, Kevin toured with uh, R.W. Schambach. He's uh, friends with Steve Hill and, and just a lot of guys. And uh, I'm, I'm just waiting to see what God's going to do. But in the midst of that, I caught on fire. Been 35 years since I've experienced anything like this. The last time I did, I was in Germany. And God began, and I was on the tail end of a 25-year revival. That I mean, it was such a revival, and it's, it, it started because an old druggie that was one of the main distribution points in the military got saved. He was already burnt out. He got saved. And 25 years later, even though the, the revival had kind of begun waning, they still couldn't get drugs within 25, 30 miles of that area. It, it's, it's like the, the, the MPs were like Holy Ghost watchdogs. They would, they would find drugs and some of the crazy, they could, you, unless it was prescribed by a doctor or you bought it over the counter, you just couldn't get it in there because that's what God does when he does some things like this. And so, I mean, there, there's a connection with us and, and Prince Albert that I think is going to stay for, for a long, long time. And I'm beginning to feel the fire of God begin to burn in me. Uh, I've been kind of fanning the flames on Mary. Can you tell a little bit of difference in her this morning? We've been praying together, and, and I've been trying to stir up my coals and stir up her coals and to, and to revive the vision. In fact, you know, when I, when I taught on the, um, the tabernacle within as a part of New Wineskins, I almost need to go back and reteach that whole thing from the point of fire. Because it's our job. God gives the fire, but it's our job to keep it, to keep it stoked. And I think instead of doing that, I'm going to probably end up writing a series of articles but guys, beginning today, we are starting on a journey into the fire of God and true and balanced kingdom living. I don't want to be Pentecostal for the sake of being Pentecostal any more than I want to be Hebraic for just the sake of Hebraicness. It's about the kingdom. It's about us walking with a living and holy and true and pure God. One of the things that we need to realize, guys, is that the Hebraic movement without the fire of God is actually an enigma. What caused the Hebraic movement? God came and visited Abraham. The fire of God came, and, and we're going to find out this morning, the fire of God spoke to Moses. It was a pillar of fire that kept Pharaoh back. It was a pillar of fire that moved into the Holy of Holies. If we go through and we, we're keeping the feast, we're trying to keep the Torah, we're keeping the Sabbath, we're no different than any other religion that's dead, dried, and plucked up. We have the form of godliness without the power thereof. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and uh, 5 that for those like that, we're supposed to turn away. We're not supposed to come build a bigger denomination around it. Now, there's been a lot of things in the past that have been called the fire of God that are not the fire of God. How many know emotionalism is not the fire of God? Loud music is not the fire of God. Rock and roll is not the fire of God. Look at me. Rock and roll is not the fire of God. It's another kind of fire. 
You see, when I was in that revival years and years ago, we were singing Hosanna songs and having people fall out before God getting right with him. So instead of boom, 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 it was ascribe to the Lord, O Holy One, ascribe to the Lord, glory and praise. With that, people felt the holiness of God and fell before him. We try all these external things that we call fire. Fire of God is the fire on the inside of your heart, and it's a determination that I'm going to walk with God, that my home is going to become a house of prayer, that everything I do becomes God-centric. You should be so used to the presence of God that you immediately pull away when his presence isn't there. Do you know something followed me from Marshfield when I went up there? It wasn't God. Because there were witches assigned to, to snuff out what we've been trying to start. And, the, and we, we met Thursday night, had a wonderful time. Kevin and I are walking into his office. Now he has his office and he has a, like a big boardroom with a big table. We walk in and it's like we stepped into a void because we had been enjoying the manifested presence of God ever since I got off the plane. And it was like he walked into a vacuum and I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, he said, in nine years of being here, this has never happened. Michael, what did you bring with you? <laughs> well, good, some of Marshfield come up here with me. So we prayed, we drove it out, and immediately the presence of God came back in. But I think it was also showing us, guys, how presence of God sensitive are we? Can we, can we feel his presence in the stillness of the night? Can we feel his presence in the den of what's called life out there? We have got to become presence of God sensitive. That's part of the fire. Whatever is not in harmonics with the fire of God within us, we've got to say, I, I don't want to be a part of that. If God's not in it, how many know that you walk into a situation and God's not there? Maybe you shouldn't be there. Why do you want to go someplace God doesn't want to go? <laughs> Come on now. If you step into that, you step outside of his safety. Now I want to share some things with you that, that, I, that I am seeing now, we have had past movements of God. How many know almost every denomination that's in existence today started out once in the fire of God? Now, Micah was raised Methodist. After he got around us, he went back there and it scared him. It's like Munch chanting, nah, 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 nah. reading it in response, nah, 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 in the hymnals. Yes, we rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, he said this dude is creepy. But how many know that one time in the Methodist movement, the women were so praising God that there were kids assigned in, in those old brush arbors, they would go to pick up all the hairpins to return the hairpins to the ladies who had you know, their hair all done up like this and it was down by the time the service was over because they would get excited in God in those revivals and they lose all their hairpins. And so for some kids, after a church service, their job was hairpin retrieval because after a while, those things will pile up, especially back then, they used a ton of them. In the Baptist movement, there was the fire of God. In the Seventh-day Adventist movement, there was a the fire of God. In all these different ones, there's a the fire of God. But once you get to the place where you leave the fire, you replace it with organizationalism and administrative structures. You know, it's amazing to me. I can look at, at organizations that were, that were established by apostles. And I don't care what you call them. You know, you know it, it could have been Spurgeon. They called him a pastor. How many know he was more than a pastor? They could call him bishop, whatever. God has his names. We make up ours. But what started in the fire of God ended up being handed over to an administrator. When you do that, he becomes a martician. He is just supervising that which is dead administrators are supposed to function under the five-fold ministry, not control the five-fold ministry. And we have a lot of organizations that used to have the five-fold ministry functioning within them are now having administrators say, those things don't exist. Why? Because it threatens my administration. You're administrating the dead. Guys, we have ministries that have romanced the world rather than welcoming in the fire and the presence of God. 
We have congregations. Now, let, let's not get too rowdy in praise and worship because it might spook somebody just coming in. Seeker sensitive. How about being God sensitive? Let the seekers work. Because if they're seeking anything other than the presence of God and the ways of God and the fire of God and the purposes of God, I don't want them here. They're seeking the wrong thing. Maybe God needs to tweak their seekerness, okay? And the only way that he can do that is they've got to be exposed to the real. I don't want people get, getting caught up that our cookies are the best of anywhere in the area and we serve the best lattes before church. Come on now. Or we, we have mood lighting. Get in the presence of God, you'll get in the right mood. You don't need mood lighting. It's a shame the Apostle Paul didn't have all the tweaks and things that we have today. Boy, if he could have just had a synthesizer and somebody that could dim the lights and turn on different lights and everything, he could have really had revival. He did have revival, didn't he? So much so that after preaching for three years in Ephesus, everybody brought in all the witchcraft stuff and they had the first official church wiener roast. They had kosher hot dogs as they burned up all their occultic things. I mean, you know, sometimes in our lives there needs to be a burning. There needs to be a burning. We have spiritual leaders that prefer imitation over spiritual ignition. Uh, Kevin was telling me about a, a friend of his that God's really moving in their churches, and he's kind of like me. He wears glasses. So all these preachers started showing up, and they all replaced their glasses with his kind of glasses. You know, I was looking out and saying, where's Waldo? He's all over the place. <laughs> and finally, the pastor thought it was such a joke, he went and changed his glasses, got something completely different just to throw them all off because we prefer to, to, you know, to imitate. Why imitate anything? God made you an original, but he made you an original to flow with him and his power and his fire. Quit being fake anything. Just be real. We have believer, believers giving themselves over other spirits that empower their flesh instead of yielding, yielding to the Holy Spirit that will burn up their carnality. Let me give you a few examples. Spiritual sons today take on the spirit of Absalom. I can do it better than pastor. Boy, if I was up there, I'd, I'd really have the Holy Spirit moving. No, you wouldn't because you've already grieved him by your attitude. I've discovered one thing about me. Now, I, I don't always get it right, but I really try to follow the Holy Spirit, and sometimes I do what I do to set you on fire, and sometimes I do what I do to tick your flesh off so that you find out what needs to be crucified. I have an anointing for both, don't I? Can I get a witness? Those that have known me, if there's a toe to be stepped on, I will find it. It's like a, it's like a homing pigeon. Right to it. We need to let God be God. We don't need an Absalom spirit. My thing is, if you feel like you can do it better than me, go do it out there. Just go set up your own thing. Go do it. Then you, what you're going to do is you're going to sow seeds that everybody that sits down on you is going to complain about how you don't do it right and how they can do it better. How about this yielding to the Holy Spirit? Let me tell you something. Where I'm right now is the most dangerous for my flesh. Because if my flesh gets in the way, God will start crucifying some flesh in my life to bring me back where I need to be. The wounded with low self-esteem are given the mask of pseudo-spirituality by the spirit of Jezebel. Let me tell you something. The churches are full of them. Oh, they need to be doing this. Oh, they need to be doing that. I want to, I want to control. I want to control. I got to. I've determined that if the spirit of God moves during praise and worship, I don't even have to preach. And for those of you who watch us on YouTube, if we don't have a video, it's because God was preaching that morning and you just need to pray and get it where you're at. We don't film our praise and worship. I don't want to be conscious of that. I don't want to be Hollywood. We're supposed to be birthing a new generation in the kingdom of God, but it has been replaced by aborting the anointing by the spirit of, of Athaliah. That's going on in the church today. We have ministries that emphasize feeling good now and possibly spending hell, eternity in hell over bringing God's people to a place of humility and brokenness before Almighty God to establish their eternity in heaven. I would rather you feel rotten right now 
about your old stinky carnal self and getting it right before God and broken before God now so that you make it to heaven. You know what the truth is? The best life is not supposed to be now. It's supposed to get better after you die. I'm on a journey. I'm like Abraham. I am still looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. It doesn't mean I can't have some of heaven here, but I don't want to be so earthly minded that I can no longer see heaven. I've got to have it invade what I have here. Guys, if we have ministries that emphasize feeling good now, or, or if, if we have the form and function without the fire, we are no different than the temple worship in the time of Jesus. The Holy of Holies was empty. The Holy of Holies was empty. There was no throne. There was no, there was no uh, Chabad of God. There, there, was, there was no glory of God. You know, the only time that God ever went into that temple was when he walked in, when Jesus walked in. That was the only time that God was ever in that temple. And guys, we got to not only have the form of godliness, we have to have the substance of holiness and godliness and the things of God. I want the fire, but I want the fire because his throne's here, and his throne guides the fire. Now, guys, when I, I'm, I'm going to just spend a few weeks just examining the fire of God, and really the first time I really see the fire of God is there was a guy named Moses. And he was a prince in Egypt. He tried to, he tried to free God's people in the flesh. How many know that doesn't work? And God says, what I need to do is I need to, you, you tried 40 years being a prince of Egypt. Let me go ahead and take you 40 years on the backside of the desert to find out you need to be a prince of God and not a prince of Egypt. And we pick up here in verse 2 of Exodus chapter 3, and the Lord, or the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and he looked and beheld the bush burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great side, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he, was, he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not uh, nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou sit, standest is holy ground. Moreover, I said, I am the Lord, thy, uh, the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, we can look at, and uh, there was one book called Who Ate with Abraham? He, he does such a wonderful job of showing that this scripture, that when it talks about the angel of the Lord, the way that it is given in the Hebrew, you know it is a Christophanes. Jesus appeared to Moses and commissioned him. Jesus was that angel in the fire. He was the messenger of God sent from the presence of God in that fire. Now, several things that we have here. Why did God's fire come? Why, why was that burning bush there on the mountain? God said, I have heard the cries of my people. My people are in bondage. The fire of God comes not so that we can do backflips, but to set us free. The fire of God is always initially, you got to be set free. We all have a past. And a part of the reason of that past was the devil systematically put you under in the chains of Pharaoh, of the God of this world. He hurt you. He wounded you. He taught you false things. He got you involved in false religion, whatever the case may be, to bind you up to where God could not use you and you could not be free. And so if the fire of God comes, the fire of God always comes into the, as an answer to the cry of God's people in bondage. When I was up with uh, Kevin and Teresa, we were sitting around their table talking, and just the number of ministers in Canada that want to walk away. If they had another way of, of taking care of their families financially, they'd walk away today. If they could step into another job, in fact, some of them are, are the, the, the churches are so dying up on the vine, at least up in Prince Albert, that uh, their wives are having to work for them to feed their families. Didn't used to have to. I mean, there were some of them were good-sized churches. Some of the men are now actually uh, becoming bivocational because there's not even enough coming in the offering plate to, to make, take, take care of the facilities and for them to even make a living preaching the gospel. 
And so they're, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, God, if you want me to continue here, I'm going to have to feed my family at the same time. And then they have the, the, the sheep are devouring them. Absolutely coming against an, an absolute defiance. They preach the word, and in some situations, they're having people saying, I don't believe that. No, we're not going to have that here. We're going to give enough of us together, we're going to vote you out. Man's traditions, dead religion. We need to understand that denominationalism is dead. Structures of men are dead. It does, they're, they're, they're like walking zombies. They just don't have the grace to lay down and stay down. Bill Hammond in his book on the eternal church shows that those that were on the forefront of what God was doing eventually get to the place as God begins to do something else. They will be the ones who raise up to persecute the next move of God. And they'll eventually die into this, into this dead denominationalism that has no power. But as we were sitting around that table, I began to hear a woman crying like she was giving birth. I mean, I mean, blood curdling crying. And then I heard another, then I heard another. And it was like I heard thousands of women just screaming and crying in pain. And God said, those are the preacher's wives that the body has almost destroyed. And God's going to be, begin loosening and anointing to minister to those women because the body's raising up to kill them. Number two, when the fire of God begins to return, a sense of the holiness of God takes place in the heart of the believers. He wanted to see, but he immediately knew that he could. There was this, there was this back and forth going on, and finally, God said, take off your shoes because this is holy ground. Where the fire of God is, it's holy. You don't mess with it. You don't mess with God. God is holy. You don't change God. God changes you. He is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. He is holy. I listened to an expert in Greek and Hebrew years ago, and he said the best way to define the holiness is the absolute other. Whatever you are, go on the opposite end of the spectrum, and there's God. And when I come into contact with that, my response is childlike faith, and broken humility that I realize that I've messed up, that I've left God somewhere, that I don't have it all planned out, that I can't build my life, I can't build a church, I can't do anything. If God does not build the house, those that labor, labor in vain. And it's whether it's the house of God in a ministry or the, your house, your home, we need to scrap every idea that we have about what a mother and father is supposed to be and how a home's supposed to be and how a world tells us it's supposed to be, and we need to go back to the Word of God and say, God, you build it. Because every one of us had lousy examples going all the way back to Adam. Mom and dad ate them out of the house at home. They get cast out of paradise. And you have one brother raising up to kill another brother. How many know that the first family got dysfunctional? We've been dysfunctional ever since. But we need to return back to the pattern of God. Let God build the house. Every one of us needs to say, God, I don't know how to be a parent. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a wife. You show me how. In humility. And in, in not only childlike faith, but childlike simpleness. That I don't have it all figured out. You show me how to do it. That's what the fire of God should do in us. Guys, the fire of God first appears to empower a movement to set people free. This is the only function of God's fire until freedom is truly achieved. And I'm not just talking about us sitting in this room. I want Marshfield. I want Webster County. And I'm not just talking about us building some mega church. I want to see every pastor in this area set free and healed and restored. I want to see every church filled with saints that are being restored, that, that love God with all their heart and are trying to live the word of God the best they can, and God begin to build on it. I mean, no, God will lead them into their commandments because there has never been a true revival of God that they didn't end up with the commandments of God. I'm not worried about that. You know, in America today, this month, in the month of April, 2,000 veteran ministers, I'm not talking about newbies trying to get a work off the ground, I'm talking about veteran ministers walked away from ministry never to go back to it again. 
Now, many of them, and I mean some of them that, that pastor larger churches, why put up with all that hassle when you can get three times to pay and actually have somebody appreciate you in the corporate world? And that's where we're losing a lot of them. They're tired of all the junk that we call church. And I have found out church boards, most of the time, are church splinters. They're boards that have never been sanded. <laughs> They're full of nails. Listen to me. The true fire of God always produces godly fear. Moses went down there, and those guys actually had to learn how to fear God again. They'd been 400 years away from, away from God. They had learned to, to fear God. They feared Pharaoh, but they didn't fear God. And I've seen past movements, Mary and I have been to some of them, where supposedly it was the fire of God falling. Everybody got haughty. Those touched by it got their nose stuck up in the air. That's another kind of fire. How many know that's a fire from hell? If it pops off the flesh, it's not the fire of God. If it crucifies the flesh, it is the fire of God. But what's part of the problem today? What's going on? We have the church teaching that you can do anything because of the cross. You can do anything you want. Have you heard that on Christian Airways? Or we don't even really have to preach today because eventually God is going to reconcile the whole world unto himself. Isn't that what Paul said? And so everybody's going to get saved when this whole process is over. Some are even going as far as even the devil's going to get saved. I'm thinking, what kind of stuck on stupid is this? Haven't you wondered? And God kept on taking me. You know, I'm expecting for him to take me to the book of Acts because I, I want some of that book of Acts stuff. You know what I mean? And I said, God, what, what do you want me to do? And he, he takes me back to the book of Judges. And I go, whoa, that's a, back on the other side of the book. I'm trying to get to the book of Acts. He says the only way to get to the book of Acts is to go through the book of Judges. Because the problem right now we have in the body of Christ, and this is repeated four times in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That is the preaching state of the body of Christ today. There is no king. Jesus is not ruling and reigning. He does not see what we're going to do. He know, and, and, and see, part of the judgment is sometimes God elongates judgment not only to, to give everybody a chance to repent, but give people enough rope to hang themselves as well. I can just do what I want to do, and there's no consequences. I can, even, I can even build a mega ministry on it, and I can have hundreds of thousands of people believing that grace has, has allowed me to, where I can commit adultery, and it's okay. You know, and I, I, have, I have talking with some people that are movers and shakers in the body of Christ, and what they're saying is these guys have sin in their own life. Instead of dealing with the sin, they've let the sin change their theologies because there's no king. Men are doing what's right in their own eyes. In this last days, guys, God is going to raise up true apostles and true prophets that are going to act as judges in the body. When you read the book of Judges, God's people are going along, they're walking with God, they're doing their commandments, and they slowly start moving away from the commandments to the place that they're walking so much in the flesh that the nations around them make them slaves. And so God will raise up a judge to vanquish the enemy, to set God's people free, and to restore divine order again. But because there's no king, after a while they kind of wander off and they do the same thing over and over and over again. Now, in, in looking at this, this is mentioned four times. And, and how many know this isn't by accident? God mentions four times in the book of Judges that they had no king. They did what was right in their own eyes. Now, biblically, four is the number of earth. It's the number of the world. It's the, because the, the material world, was, was for that, that part of creation was finished in four days. But it also, as I begin to study this, I think the brother that put that one book together in biblical mathematics missed it because in uh, Malachi, it basically said Jesus was going to come back on the fourth day in the fourth millennium. It's also a number of Messiah. And what I begin to realize is that there is carnal materialism and there is Messiah and there are access, A-X-I-S, realities. 
You can't have them both together. It's almost like excess hormones in your body. You're either creating insulin or you're, cre- or you're, you're creating glucose in your body. You, you can't do the both at the same time. It has to be one or the other. Jesus can't rule and reign where there's worldly materialism. And so because, because Messiah wasn't ruling and reigning, they, worldly materialism took them captive. But as you begin to seek the face of God, worldly materialism begins to fade and Jesus begins to, and all you want's him. You can't be materialistic and walk with God at the same time. They're diametrically opposed to one another. Both cannot exist in the hearts of men. In the day of preaching, hyper grace, hyper prosperity, and hyper worldliness, the body of Christ has no king. Each member is doing what's right in their own, own eyes. And it has gotten to the place, George Barna here a couple years ago, and I, I, I showed you a clip of it here two years ago, that said that he said, designer Christianity is here. We have a generation that, you know, if you want to order a computer, you jump online, you have it customized the way you want to. You want to buy a couch? Now you can go to certain places, and you can pick the couch. You pick what kind of what kind of covering you have, and they will custom make that thing for you and send it to you at the same price. We're in we're, we're an attitude. I want everything customized about what I want. And so we have customized Christianity that we basically get rid of all the things our flesh doesn't like, and we build a, a, a Christianity based out of the flesh. That's this, every man doing what's right in his own eyes. God is not in the mix. God is not here to make your flesh comfortable. He's here to crucify it. He's here to burn it up so that he can release holiness and godliness in your life and to release some true power in your life. You know, any time, guys, that we try to move away from the God as he is revealed in this Bible... Well, and we're doing it with Jesus. You know, there, how many know there's a multiplicity of Jesuses when you, when you turn on Christian television today? We have the, let's make a deal, Jesus. We have the, anything goes, Jesus. We have, we have the beach, Jesus. It's all just groovy. We have the prosperity, Jesus. Come to Jesus so he can make you a millionaire. Anytime you deviate from what God has revealed himself, you have built a false idol. And in churches across the country and in ministries on television today across this nation, they are guilty of idol worship. I want the true Jesus. I want the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just like he revealed himself in his divine revelation to us. God didn't stutter when he said, this is the right stuff, nor did he stutter when he said, this is the bad stuff, nor did he stutter when he said, I'm unchangeable, I'm unmovable. Come on now. There's something also interesting in the book of Judges. You read, where, and they use this in a general term, the Canaanites, and that really kind of, and Judges, referred to all those living in Palestine. All the Canaanites, constantly, you'd have a Canaanite over here rise up and take the people of God into captivity, and he'd have to be driven out. And then you'd have one raise up here and one raise up here. So I looked at what the word Canaanite means, or Canaan means, and it means lower the lowlands. You see, what's interesting is, is that uh, Satan always wants to get you into a low life, a carnal state, your base urges, your base desires, things of the carnality, things of the flesh that want to take you captive. You also need to realize that Canaan was the son of Ham. From his line, he begat Cush. Cush had a brother named Mizraim. Cush and Mizraim established Babylon and Egypt. It wasn't just Nimrod that established Babylon. Nimrod began to do the work of his father of what Cush founded. Nimrod began to build on, and his uncle built Egypt. So all of Egypt, all of Babylon sprung out of Canaan. How many know there's a Babylonian system in this world today that wants to absolutely take the fire of God out of your life? Wants to, wants to make you so carnal that the, it, wants, it wants Christians to lose their salvation, deny the very Christ that set them free, to deny the word of God. And it's that Canaanism that God is going to raise up judges in today, in, in the church today, to set God's people free. 
I remember Jim Baker was talking about in a church where he had pa- that he went to speak, and, and he, 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 he got literally nauseous before he got up to speak. He says, brother, I can't speak. I'm so sick, I can't even hardly stand up. And the pastor says, you have to because everybody's here. You know, people have come from far and wide. And he began to get up, and as he, and at this in faith, he began to speak. He began to see coffins lined up in the front of the church, in the spirit realm. And he got up and said, you know, there have been those of you that have tried to control this church and to control this pastor, and God's had enough. You either repent, or God's going to take you on. I see coffins in the front of this church. He said, well, that was a bold statement. You know, the story hadn't finished yet. The pastor calls him back and says, you need, you need to come back to the church tonight. The people are here. And when he walked in, the, the pastor was white as a ghost because one of the main leaders in the church dropped dead that afternoon. Dropped dead. I was talking with Kevin. And I, now, he's went way up north ministering. You know, you know Prince Albert's north enough for me. <laughs> I think it's on the... Uh, s- s- 23rd parallel. There's only one other city in all of, all of Canada on that level that actually has more than 40,000 people. It's just too cold. He went way up north. He's told me stories. They're actually having a, they're, help, they're help building another church up north because the residents of the city burned the church to the ground. And so they're sending them all the materials to build a steel building because steel's a little harder to burn down. Another pastor, he told me about that somebody broke into the church and smeared feces all over the inside of the church and the pastor walked away. That's what these guys are having to deal with. Because not only do you have First Nations people, you have First Nations people involved in paganism that have lots of alcohol. And so there are machetes and axes and knives. And so he's up there preaching. Half the elders don't want him there, but they, they allowed him to live on. And one of the chief elders was bringing accusation against him to get him driven off of the reservation. And so he said the day before he saw that guy, and I mean, the dog sled the whole nine yard going by, you know. Up there they don't have vehicles. There's, there's places up there only twice a year could even bring supplies, and the lake has to freeze solid to get supplies up in there. I'm talking way north. And so the guy goes by in this sled, and as, as, as Kevin's pr- uh, praying, he sees the guy dragging a coffin. He said, oh, my God, the man's marked for death. That night, two big thugs from the council came said, the council wants to have a meeting. He said, he goes, when I walked into it, I didn't realize that I was on trial. It had, it had a multiplicity of chiefs at that reservation, and one of them, he led to the Lord a week before. The guy was drunk, fell, in, fell into, his, in, into his stove and was burnt all over. He actually showed up at his door burnt and bloody saying, I need Jesus. How many know there's either time to believe God or just go home? Led him to the Lord. And so they're, they're making all these accusations against him. And that one chief stands up and says, I know one thing. Not, he, he led me to Jesus and saved my life. He's a man of God. And that one chief kept, we, we need, you know, it's, it's like not only do I want to drive him out, I, I want to kill him. He had a murder spirit on him. The next day, that chief dropped dead of a heart attack. You see, when God moves, God doesn't mess around. We need to understand there's going to be a shaking and moving in the body of Christ. I'm not just talking in this congregation. I mean, I'm, I'm talking bigger than this. We're in, in the, uh, I believe as we seek the fire of God, we're going to see God give birth to some things, and we're going to see God take some things on to its reward. We need to realize God's no longer gonna, going to tolerate a Canaanite spirit to enslave his people anymore. God's going to begin raising up judges. Guys, we need to understand when Messiah is not the absolute king of your life, you will default to your lower carnal nature, and you'll always become captive to the, uh, the Canaanite Babylonian system of this world. Who, and one of the things I need to ask you this morning, who really is the Lord of your life? Is it you? Or have you manufactured a Jesus that you can live with? Not ask a lot out of you. You know, the, this Jesus that I made, he doesn't get too angry at me when I get in the flesh and I watch things I shouldn't watch and say things I shouldn't say and do things I shouldn't do. He says, it's okay, it's all grace. Go ahead and do it. I've I've now sanctified that. Then you got a Canaanite Jesus, and you're captive and don't know it. 
Today, the body of Christ, there is no king. Because of this, the majority of the body are enslaved to the Babylonian Egyptian system that appeals to the baser aspects of fallen man. And that includes a large portion of the Hebraic heritage movement. You can be in bondage and keep the feasts. You can be in bondage and keep the Sabbath. Uh, If that isn't the truth, then why weren't all the Pharisees in revival when Jesus showed up? Hmm? There wouldn't have been anything like Sadducees. There'd have been revival. But they were going through the motions, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They showed up to John the Baptist meetings and he said, snakes and vipers, bring me something as proof that you've repented and gotten right with God. God is beginning to call apostles and prophets to the task of becoming judges in the body of Christ to see them set free. The response of the apostle prophet must be humility and godly fear and to one hear what the fire of God is speaking just like Moses did. To hear what God is saying. Not what I need to, what, not what I think is going to be popular. Not what I think is going to draw a crowd. What is the fire, what is Jesus saying out of the midst of fire? If we don't have that, we don't have anything. And number two, to be commissioned by the fire of God for kingdom assignments of setting his people free in these last days. That's going to be part of what we're about here. That's why God is that. That is the next major move of God is he is going to restore and set apostles and prophets back into their place so they can hear the fire and begin to speak what that fire says and be commissioned to get God's people free because we cannot hold our own with what's coming unless we're free people on fire for God. Now, God is calling us to have both the form of godliness and the power of godliness. We got we to gotta have the right form for the fire to fill. So what's our response to this? Number one, we're going to have to humble ourselves before a holy God. God is holy. You're not. God is holy. I'm not. God is right. We're wrong. We don't tell God how things should be. God tells us how things should be. We don't tell God this is the way that we want to do it. God tells us this is the way that we want to do it. Guys, we have got to learn to repent of allowing the ways of the Canaanites to replace the ways of the kingdom in our lives. That's why the initial response has to be humbleness because we have all got a lot of repenting to do. We have all got, we need correction. That one song we sang this morning is, I need your discipline. I want you to come as a loving father. The first place God may want to set you on fire is your blessed assurance. He may want to set your rear end on fire because you need some correction. God, I was praying for fire, but I didn't mean for it to fall there. Sometimes it needs to start there before it can get to the heart. If you're like me, sometimes the quickest way to your heart is to begin there. It gets the heart's attention, doesn't it? Guys, we're beginning the process of seeking the face of God, the place from which the fire of God flows. We're beginning. Well, Mike, what happens if I spend the next five years seeking and repenting and seeking the fire of God. Where am I going to be? Let me ask you something. Where are you going to be in the next five years if you don't? Hmm? This is a process. We got to yield to the process of God. Jesus is coming like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap, and he's going to take you from this kind of glory to glory and faith to faith. That he heats you up, he takes off the dross, he lets you cool down, he heats you back up again to bring up more dross out of your life. We want God to purify us. I want you to get to the place to where if you're at Walmart, You can say like Peter, silver and gold have I none, but that which I give unto you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. 
We're so caught up with the silver and gold that we can buy them some chips. How about getting something that goes beyond chips? How about giving them where their life is turned around because the fire of God's there and they can see it and they say, I want that. What we don't realize, guys, other places of the world, what's coming over American Christian TV is destroying the body of Christ. They look to America to set the stage, to set the pace. And now what they're seeing is they replicate what they're seeing on Christian TV. The body of Christ is dying in Kenya. The body of Christ is dying in Africa. People are fed up with it. That's why I can have a little Malaysian girl. Almost has to stand on her tiptoes to be five foot tall. Can get behind the, the pulpit of these preachy, fiery black men of Africa that used to have the fire of God on them. That now what they're imitating on, t- on TV is killing the people of God. And she sits up there and just begins to teach the word and teach the word. And people begin to fall over themselves just to hear the word because they're not hearing any of it. We've got to realize the abomination that has happened in our country. No wonder the left is winning. No wonder sin is winning. If we put that forth as the best of what we have, we're losing. We need to realize that. I want the fire of God in your house so strong that it absolutely transforms you. I just don't want it here. I want you to take it home. It's it's portable. It's meant to be in your hearts. And it begins to change everything that you do. It can even make speakers twirl around. It also helps if you have a size 15 shoe. It gets caught on stuff. See, this is not about being perfect, guys, as the world considers perfect. It's being honest having childlike faith before God and say, Daddy, I don't know anything, but what I do know is I love you. I want your ways. My ways don't work anymore. I'm tired of my kingdom. It doesn't work anymore. I want you. I'm tired of being my own worst enemy. I'm tired of giving the devil a holiday because I sabotage myself by the stupid things that I do. Father, those parts of me need to die. They need to get the fire. I need to quit letting my attitude bring me captive to the Canaanites. Lord, come send your fire. Send your fire. Realign me with your kingdom. I want Michael to come up, and I want us to sing uh, Consumer.